So this is going to be a much longer video than you are used to get from me. So I am going to tell you what it is all about and then you can decide whether you want to watch it or not. Before we begin, let me thank all the patrons who have helped me make my presentation in St. Louis possible. It was an invaluable experience to me, and now I know that I can speak at such an event with confidence. If you are interested in supporting me, please visit the Nuclear Humanist Patreon page. Now, let's get a move on. I try to be an ally of the scientists who try to explain why our influence on the planet is bad and how we can fix this. More importantly, mo those who embrace mathematics, physics, chemistry, i.e. science in general, and those who have found out that the green narrative isn't going to work. One of these scientists is James Hansen. He is sometimes called the father of climate change, and rightfully so. He has been dividing his time between research, testifying before Congress, writing and activism, and has done so for decades. He is a great example to me. So once you see through the green narrative and understand that the 100% renewable idea doesn't survive careful scrutiny and acknowledge that more sources of energy like nuclear energy are required, you are bound to find yourself in the spotlights. People are going to find reasons to critique you. Some of these reasons may be valid, but most of them are not. Even worse, most of them are fabricated on the spot. Which brings us to the end of this introduction. Jim Green is an Australian activist against nuclear energy, and he has written a hit piece designed to discredit James Hansen, but has done so by misrepresenting him along the way. This is as disingenuous as it gets. Now it is fairly simple. My goal is to expose the tactics Green and his ilk deploy to try to misinform and misdirect. Keep your eyes open and use your mind. So let's begin. By Jim Green on August 28, 2017. James Hansen's Generation 4 Nuclear Fallacies and Fantasies. This is an interesting and catchy title. I assume that you, as a subscriber of my channel, are very intelligent and well read in. An argument based on a logical fallacy has no merit and can be dismissed out of hand. Let's see who is fallacious, Jim Green or James Hansen. Here we go, and I quote, The two young co-founders of nuclear engineering startup Transatomic Power were embarrassed earlier this year when their claims about their molten salt reactor design were debunked, forcing some major retractions. The claims of MIT nuclear engineering graduates Leslie Dewan and Mark Massey were trumpeted in MIT's technology review under the headline, What if we could build a nuclear reactor that costs half as much, consumes nuclear waste, and will never melt down? Now, what if I told you that that headline was perfectly fine? The question is whether Massey and Dewan had accounted for certain unforeseen issues. And the answer to this question is no. But that doesn't mean that the molten salt reactor, of which they were envisioning only one of a multitude of different designs, cannot fulfill all of those promises. Let me demonstrate. 1. The fuel and the cooling medium are one and the same in a molten salt reactor system which means that the thorium or uranium or plutonium is dissolved in a salt. Think about sodium chloride, for instance, which is stable salt, or lithium beryllium fluoride, or many other possibilities. The freezing point of these salts depend on the manner in which they are mixed, but we may generally assert well above 100 degrees centigrade. This means that the meltdown 
indeed is impossible since the fuel is already molten. In fact, when we stop the fission process by driving down control rods or by the automatic melting of a freeze block, the fuel salt gets drained into a tank where the geometry is either going to stop criticality or the absence of a moderator will do the same. The fission process stops and the fuel salt mixture will start to cool down. Decay heat can be removed passively and it doesn't require any water flow or pumps. So we get a freeze down rather than a meltdown. This is the complete reversal of a modern automatic shutdown of a reactor. This design of which Transatomic Power was designing a version would deliver on that promise. There's no question there. 2. Burning nuclear waste can be done in many different ways. One of the most promising molten salt reactor concepts that is being designed with this idea in mind is the molten chloride fast reactor of Elysium Industries. 3. The promise of a cheaper reactor can be justified by quantifiable improvements over contemporary water reactors. The first of which is that the burn up of the fuel is much better. It may not be 95% as transatomic power promised, but it will still outperform current re water reactors by orders of magnitude. Also, the reactors are much smaller less complex and can be produced modularly. Building times are shorter and therefore these reactors are cheaper. Much cheaper, in fact. Thorcon Power has an excellent white paper on their capital expenditure and operating and maintenance costs. They envision a reactor concept that comes in at 1.2 US dollars per kilowatt of capital expenditure and 30 US dollars per megawatt hour, which is cheaper than onshore wind. Let's continue and see what Jim Green has to tell us. MIT physics professor Cord Smith debunked a number of Transatomic's key claims. Smith says he asked Transatomic to run a test which he says confirmed that their claims were completely untrue. Kennedy Macy wrote about Transatomic troubles in Power Magazine. This was another case of technology hubris, an all too common malady in energy, where hyperbolic claims are frequent and technology journalists get all too credulous. Pro nuclear commentator Dan Yerman said that. Other startups with audacious claims are likely to receive similar levels of scrutiny and that it may have the effect of putting other nuclear energy entrepreneurs on notice that they too may get the same enhanced levels of analysis of their claims. Now, Jim Green subsequently jumps to several conclusions and I don't get where he gets them from. Well, yes, others making false claims about Generation 4 reactor concepts might receive similar levels of scrutiny, or they might not. Arguably, the greatest sin of the transatomic founders was not that they inadvertently made false claims, but that they are young, and in the Wands case, female. But what is even more egregious is the fact that Jim Green tries to attribute some sort of discrimination to this entire subject. Remember, even though James Hansen has only been mentioned in the title, no one else has been mentioned so far. So who is discriminating against Leslie Dewan? Why is this she is young and female argument in there in the first place? This is setting up the reading audience against the nuclear industry by deploying a subjective statement without any form of argumentation or substantiation, and we should dismiss it out of hand. My first question is this, who thinks that these two graduates are too young? And who thinks that the one being a woman is an argument against her? Presenting these arguments is abjectly wrong.
So let's see what Green has to say. Aging men seem to have a free pass to peddle as much misinformation as they like without the public shaming that the transatomic founders have been subjected to. A case in point is climate scientist J.R. Aging men seem to have a free pass to peddle as much misinformation as they like without the public shaming that the transatomic founders have been subjected to. A case in point is climate scientist James Hansen. You would struggle to find any critical commentary of his nuclear misinformation outside the environmental and, note, anti-nuclear literature. So, first of all, what does age have to do with anything? What is the correlation between those who supposedly shamed the one and Massey and James Hansen? There's absolutely no link between the two. As for the second part, do you think the people who write anti-nuclear literature are credible? Do they, pre do they publish peer-reviewed papers? If so, why don't they come forth with an intellectually honest answer to Hansen's hypothesis. Green says, Hansen states that 115 new reactor startups would be required each year to 2050 to replace fossil fuel electricity generation, a total of about 4,000 reactors. Let's assume that Generation 4 reactors do the heavy lifting, and let's generously, generously assume that mass production of Generation 4 reactors begins in 2030. That would necessitate about 200 reactor startups per year from 2030 to 2050, or four every week. Good luck with that. Now it's funny, I use the good luck with that argument all the time, but when I do so, I have done the math. I don't think 200 reactor startups is impossible at all. If you have read any of the white papers by Thorcon Power or Terrestrial Energy, you'd be too. What else would constitute mass production, by the way? We are already building 60 old school reactors as we speak. Once we get into building truck sized reactors, which do not have to cope with high pressures, production speeds can indeed be sped up significantly. Aside from that, I have done extensive research in commodity requirements for wind and solar, and from my own research I can tell you with great confidence that it is highly unlikely that wind and solar are going to replace a significant portion of our extant and future coal and gas-fired electricity generation anytime soon before the 2050s. I don't think that Hansen is that far off with, with his own calculation. Think about it. 200 small modular reactors between 250 and 500 megawatt a year is somewhere between 50 and 100 gigawatts of capacity a year. And do note that we can build 4 to 8 on one side if need be. Yet you think we can manage on wind and solar. Care to back this assertion up? And may I ask of you a copper use analysis? Assume about 5 metric tons of copper per megawatt for wind and solar and try to achieve 50 to 80 terawatts of capacity. From my own models, I conclude that we will be left with at least 32 terawatts of deficit on the 50 terawatt scenario. With an incredibly optimistic and sustained copper production growth rate of 5.5% per year, we would, have to, we would have built less than half of all the required wind turbines and solar panels. Where do the other 32 terawatts come from? In your world, where nuclear power has been neutered, the energy would come from natural gas. As much hydro, maybe a little more than we have today, coal, and biomass. So Green says, moreover, the assumption that mass production of Generation 4 reactors might begin in or around 2030 is unrealistic. A report by a French government authority, the Institute for Radiological Protection and Nuclear Safety states, there is still much R&D to be done to develop Generation 4 nuclear reactors as well as for the fuel cycle and the associated waste management which depends on the system chosen. 
Likewise, a U.S. Government Accountability Office report on the status of small modular reactors and other advanced reactor concepts in the U.S. concluded, both light water SMRs and advanced reactors face additional challenges related to the time, cost, and uncertainty associated with developing, certifying, or licensing and deploying new reactor technology. With advanced reactor designs generally facing greater challenges than light water SMR designs, it is a multi-decade process. An analysis recently published by the, in the peer-reviewed literature found that the U.S. government has wasted billions of dollars on Generation 4 R&D with little to show for. Lead researcher Dr. Ahmed Abdullah from the University of California said that despite repeated commitments to non-light water reactors and substantial investments, more than $2 billion US dollars of public money, no such design is remotely ready for deployment today. So let me respond to this. You think that 2 billion US dollars is a lot of money? The Topaz PV plant in California, which is rated at about 550 megawatt and which will be torn down again in about 20 years, costs the ratepayer 2.4 billion US dollars. Given the complexity and heavy regulatory pressure on new reactor concepts, a measly $2 billion is a drop in the bucket. Aside from that, $2 billion would buy you about 1,666 megawatts of foregone capacity, with a lifetime of roughly 60 years, generating about 18 times more energy than the Topaz PV plant would ever do. The fact that there has been a smidgen of development money and not much to show for is no reason to stop nuclear development. It only provides an incentive to move things along faster and allocate more resources to streamline the process. And all this tells me that you are out to misinform your public. You're trying to make a point, but you actually show us why the development is rather stagnant if DOE and government incentives are concerned. They should help the startups rather than push them to China, Indonesia or other countries with this quasi help. And before you start screaming about money and things being too expensive, let me remind you that we do not, and I repeat, do not produce enough materials to facilitate a renewable build-out either. It's not about money alone. It's also about having to get the required materials in the first place. Jim Green says about nuclear weapons. In a nutshell, Hansen, amongst others, claims that some Generation 4 reactors are a, are a triple threat. They can convert weapons usable material they can convert weapons usable material and long-lived nuclear waste into low carbon electricity let's take the weapons and waste issues in turn hansen says generation 4 reactors can be made more resistant to weapons proliferation than today's reactors and he claims that modern nuclear technology can reduce proliferation risks but are new reactors being made more resistant to weapons proliferation and are they reducing proliferation risks? In a word, no. Now my response, no, the answer is yes. It is entirely up to the designer, the licensing party and the operators and the agencies to maintain a chain of proliferation resistance. Aside from that, we've now conclusive proof that rogue states will build nuclear weapons regardless whether they have civilian nuclear reactors or not. Civilian nuclear reactors do not contribute to proliferation. Multilateral oversight ensures this. Jim Green says, Fast neutron reactors have been used for weapons production in the past and will likely be used for weapons production in the future. Now my response to this is that this is a slippery slope. 
these countries already have weapons and they created these weapons purposefully not by piggybacking off civilian nuclear power but by creating special enrichment utilities and government owned and dedicated plutonium breeders to create the weapon stockpile. Jim Green says, India plans to produce weapons grade plutonium in fast breeder reactors for use as driver fuel in thorium reactors. Compared to conventional uranium reactors, India's plan is far worse on both proliferation and security grounds. To make matters worse, India refuses to place its fast breeder thorium program under IAEA safeguards. Hansen claims that thorium-based fuel cycles are inherently proliferation resistant. That's garbage. Thorium has been used to produce fissile material for nuclear weapons tests. Again, India's plans provide a striking real-world refutation of Hansen's dangerous misinformation. My response to this is that this continuous emphasis on creating fissile material is an impossible demand from the anti-nuclear crowd. It is quite simple. You cannot have a sustained nuclear reaction without fissile material. Right now, we mostly produce energy from low and rich uranium. This means that the amount of fissile uranium-235 has been increased from about 0.7% to somewhere around 5% of low and rich uranium. We have a multitude of options and I will tell you why there is a proliferation argument there and why this argument is moot time and time again. 1. We use regular low enriched uranium. We burn about 3% of the original fuel. The rest should be kept for the time being until we have more breeder reactors. Storing this happens in both spent fuel storage ponds and in dry cask containers. Both methods of storage are flexible and renewable. The alternative that people like you wish to see is this self-fulfilling prophecy in which we have this eternal scourge of spent nuclear fuel, i.e. nuclear waste, that we cannot solve. You raise a problem and purposefully keep us from achieving an actual solution. 2. We use spent nuclear fuel, which consists mainly of uranium-238, some uranium-235 and some plutonium, in a fast neutron breeder reactor. This means that we will breed plutonium-239 from the uranium-238. People consider this a proliferation risk, as it will make the kind of plutonium that is used for bombs. However, most reactor designs, particularly the fluid designs, don't allow for the extraction of these isotopes and use them as fuel pretty much as quickly as it is made. There is already a commercial reactor running on this principle. It is the Russian BN-800 liquid metal fast breeder reactor and has been operational for two years now. China has already ordered their own BN-800 units. 3. We use thorium-232. When we hit the thorium-232 isotope with a thermal neutron, which means that it has been slowed down by a graphite moderator, it absorbs it and turns into protactinium-233. This isotope is one decay away from becoming uranium-233, which is a fissile isotope of uranium. Anything that is fissile can be used to create a bomb or energy for peaceful means. Some designs require the protactinium to be fished out for a while. And that's the point where people claim that there is a proliferation risk. This begs the question, however, how do we get our hands on this uranium-233? It's bound up in a molten salt, in a hot cell with significant amounts of gamma radiation. It is literally too hot to handle. In terms of proliferation resistance, 
the best thing I can offer you is to create the design as such that none of these materials can be extracted from the reactor or its ancillary components, which in the case of molten salt reactors, which with molten salt reactors is likely to be the case Four, we can use these reactors to eat nuclear weapons and depleted uranium, which is the opposite of nuclear proliferation. If we build enough of these reactors, the stockpile of weapons-grade material will start to diminish. However, this is not so much of a technical problem, but more of a geopolitical one. So there you have it. You cannot have a sustained nuclear reaction without enough fissile material. Crying wolf, anytime we try to breed more fissile material and thus creating a far more efficient fuel cycle is like trying to stop us from buying battery electric vehicles and keeping us driving around in gas guzzling SUVs and trucks instead. Green says... Hansen claims that integral fast reactors, a, a non-existent variant of fast neutron reactors, could be inherently free from the risk of proliferation. Well, actually, IFRs do exist. They come in multiple forms. The Axtan BN800 in Russia is based on a liquid sodium fast breeder principle. And has, been, and has been operational for two years. And three other designs have been, and still are, in operation for years, in India, Japan and Russia. The experimental breeder reactor 2 was operated for 30 years. Aside from that, Elysium Industries is working on a molten chloride fast reactor, now, Jim Green says, that's another dangerous falsehood. Dr. George Stanford, who worked on an IFR R&D program in the U.S., notes that proliferators could do what they could do with any other reactor, operated on a special cycle to produce good quality weapons material. My response, just because they can doesn't mean they would. This is a slippery slope argument. Now, Green says that Hansen acknowledges that nuclear does pose unique safety and proliferation concerns that must be addressed with strong and binding international standards and safeguards. So, is Green right now creating a straw man? This is not a point of contention, after all. Here he acknowledges the challenge connected to civilian nuclear energy. So we will see that this will become more relevant later on. First, Green says, There's no doubting that safeguard systems need strengthening. In articles and speeches during his tenure as Director General of the UN's International Atomic Energy Agency, from 1997 to 2009, Dr. Mohamed El Baradei said the agency's basic rights of inspection are fairly limited, that the safeguard systems suffer from vulnerabilities and clearly needs reinforcement, that efforts to improve the system have been half-hearted and that the safeguard system operates on a shoestring budget comparable to that of a local police department. Now, my response is this. There's no reason to dispute the need for good oversight. If it isn't up to the task, then we should increase budget and intensify the activities. A perfectly reasonable stance to have. There's no reason to ditch one of the most potent technologies in terms of climate change. But this is no reason to ditch one of the most potent technologies in terms of climate change mitigation. Green says, Hansen says he was converted to the cause of Generation 4 nuclear technology by Tom Blees, who wo who, whose 2008 book, Prescription for the Planet, argues the case for internal fast reactors. But Hansen evidently missed those sections of the book where Blees argues for radically strengthened safeguards, including the creation of an international strike force on full standby 
to attend promptly to any attempted attempts to misuse or divert nuclear materials. Blease also argues that privatized nuclear power should be outlawed worldwide and that nuclear power must either be internationalized or banned to address the shadowy threat of nuclear proliferation. Now my response to this, and this is very funny, who says that Hansen hasn't read these passages? Can you assert that he didn't? Suppose he did change his mind on nuclear energy by reading this book. Does that necessarily require him to accept every single premise in the book? Is it possible that he has a different interpretation? I think you're jumping to conclusions here. Again, you are strawmanning Hansen without any proof. Green says, so what is James Hansen doing about the inadequate nuclear safeguards system? Now my response is this, isn't it funny he's telling people they exist and that they need to be addressed in order to be capable of starting the production of a more proliferation resistant type of reactor that can be built and deployed quicker. You've said so yourself just a couple of sentences ago, but somewhere you decided to forget that you quoted Hansen and pop up with this. Green writes, this is one of the great ironies of his nuclear advocacy. He does, up, he does absolutely nothing other than making demonstrably false claims about the potential of Generation 4 concepts to solve the problems and repeatedly slagging off at organizations with strong track records of campaigning for strengthened safeguards. My response, this is how your straw man comes to fruition. You misrepresent Hansen as if he has been making overly optimistic claims and has been waving off criticisms and concerns. This is abject nonsense and I've shown you that it is. The fact that Hansen has been advocating to keep extant reactors open for a little while longer is because we are facing a nuclear cliff. We are headed for a ravine where only coal and gas will be able to pick up the slack. But that's something renewable ad advocates blissfully ignore. Now let's see what Green has to say about waste. Hansen claims that modern nuclear technology can solve the waste disposal problem by burning current waste and using fuel more efficiently. And he states that nuclear waste is not waste, it is fuel for fourth generation nuclear reactors. But even if internal fast reactors worked as they hoped, they would still leave residual actinides and long-lived fission products and long-lived intermediate waste in the form of reactor and reprocessing components, all of it requiring deep geological disposal. UC Berkeley nuclear engineering professor Per Peterson says, states, even internal fast reactors which recycle most of their waste leave behind materials that have been contaminated by transuranic elements and so cannot avoid the need to develop deep geologic disposal. My response to this is that this does not refuse the initial point you attribute to Hansen. That current waste by which he implies spent nuclear fuel and perhaps depleted uranium can be used to power civilization. Additionally, this waste in volume is totally insignificant and can be managed easily. Our stockpile of spent nuclear fuel and depleted uranium alone will last for thousands of years in liquid fuel reactors. Aside from that, I wonder whether we would need deep geological repository for these materials at all. Jim Green continues, so if IFRs don't obviate the need for deep geological repositories, what problem do they solve? They don't solve the weapons of mass destruction proliferation problems associated with nuclear power. They would make more efficient use of uranium, but uranium is plentiful. In theory, IFRs would gobble up all nuclear waste and convert it into low carbon electricity. In practice, the EBR2 reactor in Idaho, an IFR prototype shut down in 1994, has left a legacy of troublesome waste. 
This saga is detailed in a recent article and a longer report by the Union of Concerned Scientists, Senior Scientist Dr. Ed Lyman. Lyman states that attempts to treat IFR spent fuel with pyroprocessing have not made management and disposal of the spent fuel simpler and safer. They have created an even bigger mess. Lyman concludes, Everyone with an interest in pyroprocessing should reassess their views given the real-world problems experienced in implementing the technology over the last 20 years at Idaho National Laboratory. They should also note that the variant of the process being used to treat the EBR2 spent fuel is less complex than the process that would be needed to extract plutonium and other actinides to produce fresh fuel for fast reactors. In other words, the technology is a long way from being demonstrated as a practical approach for electricity production. Now my response to this is fairly simple. This is not the benchmark for breeder reactors. In fact, Lyman speaks specifically about the EBR2. Fuel reprocessing can be done much more efficiently in a liquid fuel process. Apart from that, as an experiment, it ran for 30 years, becoming operational in 1965. The EBR2 has served its purpose. We've learned a great deal from it. Green continues, Japan is about to get first-hand experience of the waste legacy associated with Generation 4 reactors in light of the decision to decommission the Monju fast neutron reactor. Decommissioning the Monju has a hefty price tag, far more than for conventional light water reactors. Now my response, welcome to the world of experimental reactors. You won't learn unless you build them, operate them and gain experience. Again, the Monju power plant is not the benchmark for breeder reactors. Aside from that, the Monju power plant can stay for a while longer. We don't need to tear it down immediately. There's still tons we can learn from it. It'll be around for several decades to come. In the meanwhile, it will be staffed, and that will cost money, yes. Green continues, according to a 2012 estimate by the Japan Atomic Energy Agency, decommissioning Monju will cost an estimated 300 billion yen or about 3.5 billion Australian dollars. That estimate includes 20 billion yen to remove spent fuel from the reactor. But no allowance is made for the cost of disposing of the spent fuel. And in any case, Japan has no deep geological repository to dispose of the waste. And my response, let me remind you, the Topaz 550 megawatt solar power plant costs $2.4 billion. These are the figures you can expect with large scale, complex technologies. I don't think three and a half billion Australian dollars is that much money, actually. Now, Green continues about Generation 4 economics. Hansen claimed in 2012 that IFRs could generate electricity at a cost per kilowatt less than, the, less than coal. A complex novel reactor coupled to a complex novel reprocessing system will be cheaper than shoveling coal into a burner? Seriously? Now my response is now my response is yes, seriously. Forcon comes in at about thirty dollars per megawatt hour. Terrestrial energy comes in at about fifty dollars per megawatt hour. Who knows? This might become somewhat more expensive or cheaper. Perhaps a couple of dollars, perhaps ten, maybe even twenty. That would still make these technologies competitive. In fact, if they would manage to come in at their target levelized cost of electricity, they would basically outperform anything currently on the market. Even those, quote, cheap, unquote, renewables that require backup in one way or another. And it is telling that levelized cost of electricity calculations for 
renewables don't account for backup generation capacity. Because if we would, and trust me, governments do it, they would suddenly be less attractive than the good old gas-fired power plant, which are sprouting up all over the place like mushrooms. Also, internal fast reactors, like for instance the one Elysium Industries is building, Green continues, he was closer to the mark in 2008 when he said, I do not have the expertise or insight to evaluate the cost and, and technology readiness estimate of IFR advocate Tom Blease and the overwhelming impression that I get is that Blease is a great optimist. My response to this is we have advanced in time nine years. In the meanwhile, Hansen and his colleagues have determined that renewables alone aren't going to cut it. The dangers of climate change, which he can very well assess, have now convinced him even more of the necessity of an extra of an extra source of low carbon power. There isn't any other. Hydro won't scale as needed. Biomass is yet another scourge with giant unwanted environmental impacts. Geothermal, believe it or not, has emissions problems as well. Aside from that, you are the ones who are trying to sabotage our capabilities of actually putting an end to the high carbon energy economy that exists today. I wonder who the true environmentalists are. Green continued, the US Government Accountability Office's 2015 report noted that technical challenges facing SMRs and advanced reactors may result in higher cost reactors than anticipated, making them less competitive with large light water reactors or power plants using other fuels. A 2015 report by the International Age by the International Energy Agency and the OECD's Nuclear Energy Agency arrived at the circular, disingenuous conclusion that nuclear power is an attractive low-carbon technology in the absence of cost overruns and with low financing costs. My response is a circular disingenuous conclusion so that's why we are building 60 nuclear power plants at this moment there's no way you are going to spin this green continues but the iea and ea report made no effort to spin the economics of generation 4 nuclear concepts stating that generation 4 technologies claim to be at least as competitive as generation 3 technologies though the additional complexity of these designs the need to develop a specific supply chain for these reactors and the development of the associated fuel cycles will make this a challenging task now my response to this is in the case of molten salt reactors this is actually a total non-issue as no as no special fuel assembly, for instance, is required. You will lose three steps in the fuel fabrication process and can go from refinement to deployment without unnecessary conversion steps. Additionally, maintaining the molten salt reactor is easier and waste management is much simpler as well. Green continues, the late Michael Marriott, com the late Michael Marriott commented on the EIEA and EA report. So, at best, the Generation 4 reactors are aiming to be as competitive as the current and economically failing Generation 3 reactors, and even realizing that inadequate goal will be challenging. The report might as well have commented to Generation 4 development. The report might as well have recommended to Generation 4 developers not to bother. And here is my response, which is a total non sequitur and coming from WISE slash NIRS, which are overtly anti-nuclear organizations. And my response, this is a total non sequitur and coming from WISE slash NIRS, which are overtly anti-nuclear organizations, which seek to end nuclear power in every possible way, grasping at every straw, just like you, why am I not surprised to find such a quote in one of your articles as if this constitutes an argument? 
Jim Green continues, Of course, Hansen isn't the only person accounting creatively. A recent report states that the cost estimates from some advanced reactor companies, if accurate, suggest that these technologies could revolutionize the way we think about the cost, availability, and environmental consequences of energy generation. To estimate the cost of generation for nuclear reactor concepts, the researchers simply asked the companies involved in R&D projects to supply the information. The researchers did at least have the decency to qualify their findings. Quote, there is inherent and significant uncertainty in projecting NOAC costs from a group of companies that have not yet built a single commercial scale demonstration reactor, let alone a first commercial plant. Without a commercial scale plant as a reference, it is difficult to reliably estimate the costs of building out the manufacturing capacity needed to achieve the NOAC costs being reported. Many questions still remain unanswered. What scale of investments will be needed to launch the supply chain? What types of capacity building will be needed for the supply chain? And so forth. My response, so you want this to become a self-fulfilling prophecy? Since when is being forthcoming a bad thing? Since when is being skeptical a bad thing? And I don't mean being overtly anti-seeking refutations anywhere. Don't flatter yourself. Green continues, Hansen has doubled down on his nuclear advocacy, undeterred by the Fukushima disaster, undeterred by the economic disasters of nuclear power in the US, the UK, France, Finland and elsewhere, and undeterred by the spectacular growth of renewables and the spectacular cost reductions. Hansen claims that renewables account for 1-2% to of global power generation. The true figure is 23.5%. Here's my final response. Let that sink in for a moment. If the irony doesn't strike you with the force of an anvil, nothing will. You've tried to show that James Hansen likes to fantasize about nuclear energy and has a fallacious line of reasoning. I still fail to see where that was the case. Hansen expresses the undeniable necessity for nuclear energy, and his case is being made from a quantified position. As of yet, I have not seen any true quantification from your side. Jacobson's argument has already been disputed by Hurt et al. and Clack et al. You deny the possibility of nuclear innovation by invoking semi-failed designs from the 50s and 60s. Remember, EBR2 went online in 1965 and ran successfully for 30 years. Now these old reactors just sit there. Decommissioning them will take a long while. But we are not in a hurry. They don't take up a lot of space and no one gets sick from their presence. As for the numbers, let's make it perfectly clear that Jim Green is out of his depth. And this is probably the reason why he keeps pushing his anti-nuclear agenda. He doesn't understand energy. If he really thinks that renewable power generation globally is already at 23.5% and does not realize how abjectly absurd this number is, I question whether he should be writing about energy in the first place. Let's examine the numbers. First, let's check the link he shared with us. On page 20 of the IRENA Rethinking Energy 2017 report, we see that renewables constitute 23.5% of the electricity mix of the world. This looks impressive, right? Let's take a closer look. Wind and solar combined were a measly 4.6% of the total electricity mix in 2015. And I'm sorry that I'm putting such an emphasis on the word electricity because Jim Green doesn't understand that A, hydropower is a suboptimal form of electricity. 
because it seriously affects the hydrological cycle in a negative way and because it depends on what on that same hydrological cycle which with climate change is becoming increasingly more unpredictable and unreliable but more so because energy is an entirely different proposition and far more complex matter if we consider primary energy consumption Hansen is completely right. When 1108 terawatt hours is 4.6% of the electricity generation on, in 2015, and 2015 primary energy demand was the equivalent of about 150,000 terawatt hours, then wind and solar combined are a whopping 0.7% of the total primary energy demand. So yes, James Hansen is right. Thank you all for watching.